Hello, students of statics. Welcome to this final exam review. Really just covering two chapters. In this review, we're going to cover the friction chapter, which is chapter 9 of our textbook, and also moments of inertia, which is chapter 10. Noting that the exam will be a split of this new content reviewed in this video, as well as previous content, which you can find in previous review videos. Okay, so jumping right in. Uh, in friction, we talked about fundamentally dry friction here in statics. Dry friction meaning there's a single point of contact, that that friction force is always going to resist motion. The same kind of friction that you likely dealt with in physics. Um, we can either express that friction with regards to a resultant friction force, either using capital R or capital R sub F, or we can use friction and normal forces, okay? Because the resultant force is the resultant of the friction and normal, uh, we don't want to express it in terms of both of these, okay? You kind of choose one system or the other. It turns out for blocks and wedges and slipping and tipping, we tend to use uh, the friction and normal independently. And then for journal bearings, flexible belts, and screws, um, we think of more often in terms of a resultant force. We also use an angle called phi sub s. Phi sub s is the friction angle at impending motion and only at impending motion. And it's the angle between the r and n vectors. And we can also find that angle, which is equal to the inverse tangent of mu sub s. Okay, so it's kind of laying out some of the basics. We have three phases of friction, and we focused on these a fair bit early in the friction chapter. And so if you think about um, your friction on the vertical axes and on the horizontal axes, anything linearly related to friction, often say a driving force P, that we know that friction can be available but not always used. Okay, so if you have friction with a rough surface but you don't need any of it, it would start down here, right? No friction with no force engaging that friction. And then we have a linear one to one relationship between friction and that driving force until we reach a maximum friction available. Then we sharply drop off and get to um, kind of a plateau here. And so we talked about three different zones, and I listed those three different zones um, here one, two, and three. Three, we have static but not impending, impending motion, and also kinetic. So let me label these here. So this is zone one all the way to here. Only at this point is point two, impending motion, and then kinetic is over here, three. Okay, so that kind of describes the different areas or different zones of um, friction. We then talked about slipping or tipping. And really slipping or tipping looks at if we have multiple potential motion cases and how we evaluate those. We can actually have problems that are slipping at one place versus slipping at another place. But slipping or tipping is another way that we can look at that. Often we'll solve these um, multiple problems independently and find the minimum driving force or the minimum angle, the minimum something that causes motion, and we know that that one is going to control. Uh, keep in mind, as we talk about slipping or tipping, and you can look at the GeoGebra Interactive for this, which we looked at in class. It's also linked on your Canvas page. But if you don't engage any friction, right? So say we have a weight force here, a normal force here, and no pushing force left or right, right? There's friction available. And so I could put a little note here if I wanted to. I could say, let me just draw it on here. Okay, we'll say that this F is equal to zero. And that F is equal to zero because this P is equal to zero. Okay, so essentially at that point, we are down at this lower left corner. Friction available, but not being used. As we start to push on this block, it turns out that the distribution of the normal force, keep in mind that this normal force here is really representing a uniformly distributed normal force all the way across the bottom of this block. But as we start pushing over here on this side, that normal force is going to shift further and further over toward this right corner. And so if we find the centroid of that distributed load and basically represent that with a point force, what we're saying here is that this normal force is going to shift. Okay, so as we increase our pushing force P, we still have our weight W, our normal force is shifting, and our friction is getting larger and larger. Now, given the geometry of this exact problem, it turns out that this friction force is equal to P. And when we reach the maximum friction defined by F is equal to mu sub S, times n, right, the maximum friction, then we know that it will be at impending motion. Push any, any harder, and it is actually going to um, slip. 
Okay, so um, that would be a CB, how we'd evaluate things for our normal force, noting that the location, excuse me, how would evaluate things for slipping, um, the location of the normal force is actually an unknown variable x. You can solve for it, um, but it becomes an unknown in that situation. So this is for slipping. And then for tipping, what we're going to do is we're going to move the normal force all the way to the far corner, right? You can think that if something tips, it's going to tip onto that corner. And one thing to note for tipping, add these other forces here, P and my weight force, is that at tipping, if it is tipping, then it turns out to be in the static but not impending motion range. And so here we cannot say that F is equal to mu sub s times n. It turns out that F needs to be less than mu sub s times n at tipping. So to compare slipping versus tipping, we could say, well, what force does it take for at, of P for this body to slip and then solve it again. What force P does it take for this body to tip? And whatever your smaller P is would be the controlling or basically the one that causes the motion first. Okay, that's the idea of slipping versus tipping. We then got into screws and screws are quite interesting because we're, well, we can take actually a fairly complex interaction, interaction between screw threads and the um, whatever you know, the screw threads on the screw and the screw threads on whatever is like the bolt type piece. And we can represent those with a series of equations, but we have to understand which equation to use. And so we have two different rows here. One row looking at motion, this is W against motion, and one row with the loading with motion. Fundamentally, if we're using a super simple screw like this here, and the loading is downward, or against W means the screw is going up, Okay, so let me just light that on here. So against W means that the impending motion of the screw is upwards, and with W means the impending motion of the screw is going downwards. Okay, we're basically lowering a force or we're, um, we're um, reducing a clamping force, we're lowering a car, you know, that's this whole bottom row here, and the top row here is applying a force, is raising a car, is doing something where you're actually um, adding more force to the system as opposed to removing that force from the system. And so um, if we're going our motion of the screw against the load, there's only one equation. That equation is right here, and you'll notice in this equation that you are adding together your screw excuse me, your thread pitch alpha plus your friction angle phi sub s. Okay, but you're overcoming both friction and also your load, hence you're adding those together. Um, as you go to remove a force or lower a lower that car, whatever it's going to be, you'll see that you are, um, essentially your load and your friction force are counteracting each other. Fundamentally, that's where you're having the subtraction here in your moment equation. Now, all three of these moment equations are fundamentally trying to find the moment to push the screw to impending motion. Okay, so it's worthwhile to think about, well, what's this moment doing, right? This moment is raising this screw upwards. Here we have a case where we have really steep screw threads and we don't have enough friction. And so we actually need to add a moment on this problem right here. Notice, let's look at this moment right here. It's in the same direction as raising the screw up because we're fundamentally holding this screw in place so it doesn't lower down its loan, on its own. In the book we called this, it would, the screw would unwind with its load. Okay, right in the middle between these two, we have impending motion. And so if our screw thread pitch is exactly equal to our friction angle, then we are already at impending motion. Okay, no moment added. This would not be a very stable point to design a system at impending motion. The most stable is over here on the right, self-locking. It basically means we have plenty of friction. And if you look at most commonly produced screws, they're going to be engineered that you'd be have a really hard time using those screws in a way that wouldn't produce self-locking. Okay, so we like self-locking, and notice here that this moment is in the opposite direction as it is to raise the car here. So if this is to raise the car, we're going to lower the car. We have to add some force, overcoming the friction, to get that screw to come downward, even though the force itself is also coming downward.
okay um, the other nuance piece here is just think about right hand versus left-handed threads right hand threads are by far the most common but we can also have left-handed threads you notice that here on the left-handed threads the left side is higher right-handed threads the right side is higher it doesn't matter if you flip a screw upside down look at the back side of it whatever you want to do this is always going to be true okay right-handed threads right side higher left-handed threads left side higher so screws can be part of an overall uh, frame and machine type system. Um, they're fundamentally just taking a load, putting it on a screw, and then the problem might be asking for the moment you need on that screw um, to, to do something in that frame or machine. We then talked about flexible belts, keeping in mind that flexible belts are looking at the friction of essentially between some type of cylinder and also a flexible belt. Okay, so a flexible belt contacts the cylinder over a certain angle, and we know that we could find the contact angle. We call that beta. We always measured beta, or converted it at least to radians. So here is that angle beta. And remember here for journal bearings, and also just remember this for basically any circle, that if you have a tangent line, I didn't get these drawn perfectly here, because a tangent line should show that this is perpendicular to this, and this is perpendicular to here. But these radial lines are perpendicular to tangent lines, and that helps you out with your geometry in solving for beta. But if we um, are looking at this belt system, we really need to think about the impending motion of the belt. Okay, so the belt is the outer body out here. Whatever direction the belt is in pending motion in, the larger tension will be on that side. Okay, and so if we if we conclude, there's a number of ways to conclude this, that the impending motion of the belt is going in this direction, it turns out that our larger tension, T sub L, is in that direction. Our smaller tension is on the other side, T sub S. And you can look through the previous videos or examples to look through a discussion of fixed belts and movable cylinders versus um, movable, excuse me, um, fixed cylinders and movable belts. It turns out that a fixed cylinder with a movable belt is a little bit easier to tell the direction of the impending motion because it's really the side you're pulling on harder is going to have the larger tension and it's also the direction of impending motion. Okay, so the last friction topic that we covered was journal bearings. And journal bearings had everything to do with shifting the contact point, okay? Because in a journal bearing, we have a single contact point. Um, and so if we have a journal bearing, say, that looks like the following. So let's say we have, that's our axle. Here's the space between the axle. And then here's the outer bearing. And so this is solid out here and then this inner part of course you do this in gray just so we don't make it too dark this inner part is all solid through here okay and then the question all is is just really based upon well what forces are pulling what are what are what are creating the contact point and creating the shift in the contact point and so let's say we have a horizontal tension force here call this t1 another tension force pulling here call this t2 and in this case, we're going to assume that we have a fixed, a fixed bearing, and I'll just put fixed and free. And actually, I'm put, not put that right in the middle. Sorry about that. Let me just move it up here. Free. Okay, so we have a free axle and a fixed bearing. In that case, these two tension forces, they are horizontal. They are gonna pull the free axle over to a contact point on the far right side. Okay, so that's gonna be right over here. Now the resultant force, right? In this case, we're actually gonna be drawing a free body diagram um, of the axle, right? Because the forces are applied to that axle. So in that context, actually, let me change, let me dim this out a little bit so it's not quite as, right, grab this one and this one. Okay, so now we can focus more on that axle. Um, and actually, let me just show what you'll really need to do is draw a separate free body diagram, isolate the axle. Okay, so our neutral contact point, um, call it P, is there. If your T1 is greater than T2, right? So fundamentally then your impending motion, 
we call this impending motion one, which is basically, so I am sub one is when T1 is greater than T2. Okay, so this wheel is going to want to rotate in the direction, uh, basically it's gonna stick here at P and it's gonna roll, it's gonna stick up in this direction. We know that the other way we can look at this is that we can look at the relative impending motion so this is the relative impending motion one of the bearing. And so either one of those analyses, whether sticking friction or that the shift in the contact point is in the direction of the relative impending motion of the bearing of the outside, tells us that P1 is going to be here. And then we know that because this is a resultant force um, counteracting these other two forces, that this would be, let me call this R sub one, our resultant force um, counteracting those tension forces and we know that it will be tangent to a friction circle with radius of little r sub f okay a friction circle radius and so that creates a free body diagram that we then could solve um, if we ended up with t2 greater than t1 so if we have impending motion 2 where t2 is greater than T1, then our impending motion will shift in the other direction. So I'll put impending motion two, right? With T2 being larger. Our contact point thus will shift the other direction here. We'll have the exact same parallel R sub two. Okay, so realize, let me just move this P. It should be centered up there just due to symmetry of geometry. That, um, Essentially, these are our bookends, okay? These are going to be, and so this point right here, we said this P2, let me just move this closer, there's P. And so these are the impending motion bookends. As long as the contact point is anywhere between P1 and P2, the system's actually gonna stay static, okay? And if it moves outside of P1 and P2, it's gonna go kinetic, or excuse me, it's gonna go dynamic. We would then need to use our kinetic coefficient of friction versus our static coefficient of friction. Okay, so that's the idea with journal bearings. Again, draw your free body diagrams of the body which has the forces applied to it. It can either be the axle or it can be the bearing. Make sure that your resultant forces are parallel or essentially, I mean, either parallel if both of these forces are parallel or basically canceling your applied forces and then shift that contact point. You can either think about it sticking and rolling or you can also think about um, that contact point in the direction of the impending motion of your outer body, okay, the bearing. Hence, we shifted from P to P1 in the positive right-hand rule direction, which is counterclockwise based upon this relative impending motion. All right, the last chapter that we covered looked at moments of inertia. And moments of inertia are essentially a spatial measure of the distribution of area and how that distribution of area in a shape um, ends up, how it'll influence the cross-sectional, um, excuse me, the, the stiffness of a beam depending on what its cross-section looks like, okay? And so we focused on the parallel axis theorem which is really looking at composite bodies, right? So composite bodies or composite parts means that we are dividing up a more complicated body into triangles, half circles, squares, um, quarter circles, I think that's most of the shapes that we had. And then we are adding up the moment of inertia from each of these bodies to come up with our total composite moment of inertia. Now you can have, com you can have moment of inertia about um, different axes, not only horizontal and vertical, but also axes located in different locations. And so this problem kind of walks through if you wanted to find your moment of inertia about an, a y axis, which is along the left edge and an x axis, which is along the bottom, you could find your moment of inertia of each of these three shapes. Now noting, I've changed the notation a little bit over the last couple of years. Um, this is the older notation that the Hibbler book uses where they use an X tilde and a Y tilde. Fundamentally, the X tilde and Y tilde are saying the same thing of the X bar of an element. Okay, so we started using X bar sub EL indicating these horizontal and vertical distances from the given axes. Okay, so we add up the moments of inertia of each of these three shapes to find out its composite moment of inertia. Um, it's the same kind of technique. It's actually the same X, X bar ELs and Y bar ELs that you use for centroids. Okay, so if you understand those from centroids, bring that information over and apply them now to moments of inertia. We shared one more additional equation 
which is called the radius of gyration. And the radius of gyration helps us collapse the moment of inertia and the area into one single term, noting that the radius of gyration is always going to be about the same axes as the uh, moment of inertia. Okay, so whatever moment of inertia you feed it, that will give you a radius of gyration around the same axes. Area, of course, is axes independent, right? It doesn't matter where you're measuring um, for your area. And then the last topic, the very last topic we covered um, in this chapter was the products of inertia. And products of inertia look at um, basically the... Um, the twisting of asymmetrical beams, um, and I talked more about this kind of in the notes, but fundamentally, as far as the computations go, a very similar equation up here to our parallel axis theorem transfer for the composite parts. The main difference here being that we are no longer just looking at the... Um, things with respect to one single axis, but we now are going to multiply each of these areas times both the X bar EL and the Y bar EL, okay? Because fundamentally the products of inertia are with respect to both axes as opposed to one. And we also talked about that um, this term here, the I bar, you know, the, the product of inertia about the centroid of a part of any shape is going to be zero as long as that shape has symmetry about one of the two either horizontal or vertical axes. So it would turn out that actually all three of these shapes here, the half circle, the rectangle, and also the triangle, would end up having a product of inertia of zero. Um, the half circle is symmetrical about the vertical axes, the triangle is symmetrical about the horizontal axes, and the square rectangle is symmetrical about both. Okay, so all of those would end up having a product of inertia um, about their centroids of zero, but this overall shape would have a product of inertia non-zero because we would be adding in this parallel axis theorem transfer term. All right, that concludes my exam review. I appreciate all your hard work studying for the exam. I believe in you, and thanks for your attention today.